we're about to go on a journey. A journey to explore the origins and development of Edinburgh through the ages. From its volcanic beginnings, you will see the landscape change before your eyes and discover the fascinating story behind Scotland's capital city. Beneath the ice, our battle is raging. As it melts, it carves the earth, revealing a new landscape and a prominent crag that will, in time, become Edinburgh. The first people are hunters, nomads who follow the herds and the seasons in the forest. They are some of only 2,000 people in Scotland and are outnumbered by wolves and bears. Around 4000 BC, a new idea takes root in Scotland, farming. The soil is fertile, which makes this a good place to live. As the population grows, there is competition for the best ground. The steep sides of the old volcano are easy to defend. Around 850 BC, some wise Celts make their home on the rock. As rivalry intensifies, around 400 BC, the settlement is fortified. They call their home Din Eden, the fortress on the rock. After 1,000 years of Celtic life on the rock, the Votadini must curb the advances of their rivals, the Angles of Northumberland. In AD 638, forced to retreat after a crushing defeat in England, Din Eden is eventually conquered by the Germanic tribe. From now on, Celtic Dunedin goes by the Angle name, Edinburgh. It is not until 1070 that the castle is inhabited by royalty. Ruling from Edinburgh is King Malcolm III, and it is his devout second wife, Margaret, who brings European influences to the settlement, as well as saintly piety. Royal life is fashionable, well-mannered, and religious. It is their son, David, who begins to shape Edinburgh when he becomes king. The first parliament is held at the castle. He grants tofts, long, narrow plots of land to merchants, and in return he gets taxes and loyalty. He declares it a royal borough, allowing the people to hold markets that bring in trade and money to the Market Cross. King David I turns Edinburgh into an important Scottish town, bringing reform and prosperity to the settlement. But royal rule is an uncertain business with a series of long and embittered battles for control of Scotland. It is the national heroes William Wallace and Robert de Bruce that lead the fight for the nation's freedom over the next 60 years. In 1296, Edward I of England, in his efforts to conquer Scotland, takes back Edinburgh Castle. But 20 years later, this ownership is challenged. Under cover of darkness, Thomas Randolph, the Earl of Murray, and comrade of Robert de Bruce, leads a daring raid at the north face of Castle Rock. Thirty brave soldiers slit the throats of the unsuspecting guards. With fresh English blood flowing across the floor, the invaders wait for the unsuspecting soldiers to wake. But it is too late. A bloodbath ensues and the troops who are not slain surrender. The castle is reclaimed. Soon to become king, Robert de Bruce vows the castle will never again fall into English hands. He destroys it. Edinburgh Castle is the site of many more bloody battles through the ages. It is reclaimed again and again as the English and Scottish fight to control it and ultimately Scotland. The 15th century sees Edinburgh become Scotland's capital and increasingly the centre of government and law. Trade flourishes at the open-air lawn market. The parish church of St Giles is positioned on the high street 
which is lined with impressive timber buildings and is the place for goods and for gossip. It is populated by the finest craftsmen, silversmiths, tailors and butchers, meeting every need of the royal court. And at the foot of the cannon gate sits Holyrood Abbey. With the growth of trade and a rise in the population, the city begins to expand. And with prosperity comes the need for protection. The ground on the vulnerable north side of the castle is flooded, creating the Norlock to defend the castle from attack. The city walls had extended a number of times, and in 1501, after the disastrous Battle of Flodden that leaves another king slain, another wall is built to protect the city. The Flodden Wall surrounds the grass market and the Cowgate. But the Cannon Gate is outside the city boundaries and functions as its own autonomous borough. It prospers with the construction of Holyrood Palace as the High Street becomes known as the Royal Mile. By the mid 16th century, England and France are vying for Mary Queen of Scots' hand in marriage. The prize? control of Scotland. The rough wooing commences, and as Scotland rejects his advances, King Henry VIII instructs his troops to punish the nation and put all to fire and sword across Edinburgh. In just three days, they destroy the palace of Holyrood House, much of the old town, and the port of Leith, pushing Mary into the arms of the French. Religious tensions are also growing, as the laws of the congregation, a group of Scottish nobles. Oops. Broken. Broken. Bertrand sweeps across Europe from its Germanic origins. And in Scotland, it is John Knox, the minister of St. Giles Church on the High Street and former Roman Catholic priest that spearheads the movement and corrupted with idolatry, as this day are our pestilent papists in all realms and nations. In August 1560, the Parliament in Edinburgh passes the Reformation laws and formally breaks from the papacy in Rome. Catholic iconography is torn from the churches and mass is outlawed. Mary endures a turbulent time as queen and only a year after the birth of her son, James, at Edinburgh Castle, he becomes king. Over 35 years later, and with the death of Queen Elizabeth I, James also becomes king of England. As the two crowns unite and the royal court moves south, the fabric of Edinburgh life is torn apart. It loses status, power, and trade. In the early 17th century, the castle is still seen as the protector of the city. As a result, building is confined within the medieval walls. So, unable to build out, they build up. Edinburgh is the original Manhattan, with some tenements rising over 10 stories high. Despite this overcrowding and the city's fall from grace, the parliament still flourishes. Under a legal framework pioneered by the Scots, the General Register of Sacenes is created. This legal document records the transfer of ownership from a piece of land or a building and brings with it protection and rights for landowners. So from 1617, property entitlement is clearer for everyone. Much of the city's wealth flows in and out through the port of Leith. Yet like the Cannon Gate, Leith is outside the city walls. Every year, linen, salt and beer are shipped across the North Sea, while in return, Edinburgh enjoys fine French wines, pottery from Belgium, and sugar, coffee and rum from the West Indies. The Act of Union in 1707 sees more damage done to the city, with the removal of Scotland's Parliament to London. Edinburgh loses the power and identity that have shaped it over the last 270 years. But it keeps its castle, 
holding off the advances of Bonnie Prince Charlie and his Jacobite supporters, who were in its final siege in 1745. Freed from politics, Scotland's sharpest minds reason and write, their discoveries and works reaching out from the crags of Edinburgh right across the world. These visionaries developed some of the most radical and far-reaching ideas of philosophy, science and art in Western culture. The city is discovering a new identity for itself as a hotbed of genius. In 1765, the council fund a competition to design a brand new town and farmland to the north of the castle. It is a young architect, James Cray, who comes up with the winning plan, which necessitates the training of Law Loch. Cray's new town is everything the old town is not. It is spacious, bright, clean, elegant and beautiful and becomes known as the Athens of the North. The North Bridge opens in 1772, connecting the old and new towns. But even the expansion of the city cannot stop its dark underbelly from being exposed. Edinburgh is divided. As the rich frequent the bright new town, the poor are abandoned in the old, a dark and dangerous place. The smoke and stench in the air ends at the name Old Reedy. It is on these streets that many meet their fate. Irish labourers William Burke and William Hare find their fortune cashing in on Edinburgh's poor and getting up to ten pounds each for the bodies they deliver to the university for anatomical dissection. Mary Doherty is their final paycheck before the cutthroat career choice is uncovered. In an act of poetic justice, after his hanging, William Burke is dissected in public. With the dawn of the Victorian age and the advent of the railways, Edinburgh is now recognized as a cultural hub. The coal-fired revolution makes the city bigger, brighter, and better connected than ever before. Five years into her reign, Queen Victoria is drawn to Scotland, a visit inspired by the romantic and historical novels of Sir Walter Scott. The city of Edinburgh leaves a lasting impression on the royals. It is quite beautiful, totally unlike anything else I have seen. The high street, which is pretty steep, is very fine. Then the castle, situated on that grand rock in the middle of the town, is most striking. The whole form altogether a splendid spectacle. As trains steam into the capital, they bring a new cargo. Tourists. An unlikely destination for many visitors is Greyfriars Churchyard. They come to meet Bobby, a devoted dog. He is the watchdog for a local policeman and accompanies his master everywhere. Even when John Grey dies, Bobby is still devoted to his master guarding his grave tirelessly day and night for the next 14 years. His master's final resting place becomes his home, and the Lord Provost even grants him the freedom of the city, so he can continue his vigil. Tourists do not visit the old town. The underclass are forgotten in this dark, dank, and disease-ridden district. The city finally reacts in 1867, and renovation lets light into the slums. Tenements are torn down, and new streets are cut through the heart of the old town. Moving towards the 20th century, Edinburgh gains its official city status and continues to expand. In the wake of World War II, the first ever Edinburgh International Festival begins, drawing even more tourists to the Scottish capital. The festival flourishes. Art, learning and literature are once again at the heart of Edinburgh life. As the modern city develops and grows, the government decides a new map-based land register is needed, updating the 400-year-old practice from the Sacine Register and providing owners with property guarantees for the first time. In 1995, the buildings and architecture contained within the capital gain international acknowledgement as UNESCO grants both the old and new towns world heritage status. 
recognizing how their harmonious juxtaposition gives the city its unique character. As the new millennium dawns in Scotland, its capital is enriched by the return of the Scottish Parliament, restored after an absence of almost 300 years. The rediscovery of the city's rich architectural, political and artistic heritage pours out from all parts of the city. And in 2004, it becomes the world's first city of literature. From Treasure Island to Sherlock Holmes, train spotting to Harry Potter. Both the light and dark sides of the city inspire literary masterpieces. True to its volcanic heart, Edinburgh is a vital place. Geography has shaped history as its iconic castle dominates the skyline, a reminder of all the battles fought for it. As fire once gave birth to Edinburgh, these ancient echoes reappear each year as we celebrate this dynamic city's present, past and future.